All right, uh, we talked about the reserves and um, how they can be called up to active duty. When they're in their standby mode, the typical reservist will go to work in uniform for one weekend per month for a couple of days and up to a couple weeks or so per year. And that all adds up to around 39 to 50 days for, for most reservists. That's if they don't deploy anywhere. That's if they don't get activated on any kind of uh, federal orders for a specific task. Okay? Uh, however, recently they have always been called up uh, either in part or in whole. Whole units get called up to active duty. So you will see a lot of that. Um, we talked about all of these by each service branch. There are seven because there's no Navy Guard, there's no Marine Corps Guard, there's no Coast Guard Guard. How's that? Okay, uh, National Guard and Reserves. Well, first of all, we know there's some service branches don't have a National Guard. But aside from that, they both can get called up to active duty, but only in the Guard portion with the concurrence of the state with the concurrence of state executive, the governor of that state. Okay, and the, the guard component is typically, um, its primary role is to assist the state ahead of the federal government. But if they are in traditional status standing by, the federal government can ask the governor for use of those forces. And that happens quite frequently nowadays. Um, one of the bigger draws for people to join the National Guard and the Reserves, and again, this is important when you see them in front of you here, is to understand what their motivation has been or is. It's because they can still do the best of both worlds. They can have flexibility. They don't have to get up and move every two or three or four years. Okay, they stay right where they want to in California, um, except when they have to deploy or, or go TD, temporary duty, TDY. Um, they can go to school while they are in a reserve component. And they can eventually um, enjoy the benefits of retiring from that service branch. Um, one of the benefits of hanging in there as a reserve component member, either following your active duty years or just from the start, is when you build up enough years of service as a reserve component member, you will also get that retirement benefits package of pay and, and a few other, uh, the opportunity of, of health care if you sign up for it after you turn 60 years old. If you retire as an active duty, active component member after 20 or more years, you get your retirement benefits package immediately at whatever age you retire. Um, if you are an enlisted person in the active armed forces and you enlist at age 18, you can technically be retired at age 38 and you'll get retirement pay. It's taxable. It's certainly not enough to live on by itself, typically, um, especially not in California. But, um, but it is a good start. And that's why um, many people continue to serve in the reserve components, because they know somewhere down the road they will enjoy the benefits of a retirement, just like their active component counterparts. Um, there's even better news more recently for reserve component members, members of the reserves and the National Guard. That retirement age of 60 is reduced by the number of months that you ended up having to deploy for the war effort. Okay, so um, And of course, if you're an older veteran, if I would have been a reserve component veteran, I, I'd be happy for them but sad for, for me because that, that wasn't there. Um, you know, pre-911. But again, it's sort of the, the nation seems to get it a little more now. It's like, all right, you guys have had the very unusual extra stressors of going away for months and sometimes years in, in com, you know, combined, um, even though you're a reservist, you're a reserve component member. So instead of age 60, now you added up to three and a half years overseas. Now at age 56 and a half, you're going to start collecting your retirement package benefits. So a little bit better, a little, a little bit um, more reasonable, I think, for, for payment for what they risked again. Okay? All right, so uh, you don't really need to know too much about this, and I, I always call it the decoder ring. Anyway, um, as an active duty person, who never, I never served in the reserve forces. 
um, it's difficult for me to understand. You know, I mean, you, you have to really, seriously, you've got to have like a dial on your watch you can turn and go, well, if I work this Saturday from this hour to this hour, then I'll get like double credit and uh, add all these points up and it's a good year. Yay, it's a good year. I know they, that's a common term. Um, a anyway, you will hear even more jargon um, layered on top of just the broad military speak. The Guard members and the reservists will have an additional set of uh, code talking for you. Uh, base privileges, when, when a reservist is uh, on duty, they can do all the base privileges. Everything is like they're on active duty when they're on active duty. No surprise. Okay, uh, stressors are very similar in the modern world especially to active duty um, members because they both, they have to mobilize and deploy a lot like the active duty members. Um, they, uh, unfortunately, for the reserve or the guard person, they might not have that same infrastructure where their family is living to help support the family. You know, if you're up like where I last served at Travis Air Force Base in Northern California, um, if I had to deploy, well, there's a whole base community there. I mean, my wife and kids can go on base and they buy stuff at the commissary and the BX and the... Uh, they can visit the Family Support Center on base. They can go in and ask legal questions. They can do all this stuff. If you're a reservist or a guard person, you know, you might be living in Covina or Diamond Bar. Or, I mean, you, you're somewhere where, uh, Bakersfield, say, somewhere where there is not an active duty military installation really close by. I know you guys get, Edwards isn't too far, huh? Is that the closest? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that infrastructure is not there many times, many places for, for the families of reserve members or guardsmen, okay? Um, and that's what we just talked about. Okay, uh, overall, military, all military members and their families. Here is what we see statistically they are faced with um, or what they are comprised of and then what they're faced with. Members of the... Um, you can, you can add columns two and three together, you know, to tell you uh, age range, you know, what the percentage is of each of those. Um, you can see where it's peaking out is uh, in the 20 to 24, well, we'll call it the 20 to 29-year-old group. Very large amount of, uh, of the population as a whole uh, of military members. Um, the comparable civilian labor force, right? Lower numbers here, across almost across the board, well, at least through the younger and middle, middle years. And then as you get a little older, then it overtakes uh, the military. Why? Because people do observe that sort of traditional um, military recipe of serving for, uh, if they make it a career, about 20 years or so. And then they move on to, to the next chapter in their lives. And they're still relatively young. They're still somewhere in here when they're retiring from the military. Age and gender, oh, eye chart, and if you look at the one on paper, it's probably also an eye chart. I will uh, very rapidly paraphrase. 20 to 24 year old, largest group of military members, mostly active males. Uh, second is um, reserve males and then active females and reserve females. Second, the silver medal winning year group is the 25 to 29 year olds. Okay, when you get out here to like where I am, yeah, there's only a few really dedicated people still hanging in there. Okay. Okay, by service branch, again, U.S. Army male enlisted members in blue. U.S. Marine Corps, for comparison, here we go, U.S. Navy female officer in green. U.S. Marine Corps female enlisted member, male enlisted member. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, kind of, you kind of do have some head and shoulders activities here with male and female, um, female enlisted male officer, female enlisted male officer. Uh, but, but far, far and away, every service branch, male enlisted member. So what does that tell you about here at the Beale Branch Library? It's probably who you're going to see. Yeah, eight, nine times out of ten. Good to know. Marital status, uh, male and female. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to matter so much if you are uh, 
um, enlisted versus officer within the genders of those groups, um, there is a little bit of a, looks like a little bit of a comparison trend here, enlisted females, um, not, not married as much as um, uh, the males. So again, what does that mean? Uh, well, more, more of the, uh, I guess, archaic or traditional, it's the male who is probably uh, the married guy coming in as a veteran. Okay. You do, however, see women veterans come out. We'll talk about that a little bit um, in the next module as well. Marital disillusion. And I think I just made sure this slide was in here so that you could see what was theorized was, wow, uh, what happened here? Look at those Vs. This is a very deep uh, drop in the number of divorces right around 2001. When 911 happened, everybody sort of regrouped and hunkered down in their families. It's true. And then the theory was, oh, well, you know what? That's going to keep going down here because of all these deployments and uh, because of the way our service members are, are having to be overseas constantly. And I guess pleasant surprise, there was a bounce uh, there was a bounce back, uh, sure enough, you know, it, it got back to status quo. Um, maybe that's not a pleasant surprise. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, numbers are almost identical to late 90s, pre-911 as far as, you know, uh, families having difficulties leading to dissolution of marriages. So um, we didn't see a continuance of people are just going to work together forevermore. You know, we got kind of back to reality, I guess we'd call it. So you will see that. You will see um, veterans who come in and, and part of the issues that they face are not just purely because of their service, but because, you know what, the reality of being gone all the time led to that. Or was a component. Yes? Um, veterans divorce and then get benefits that can At times, yes. And that's important for you to know that there, there can be these difficulties in sharing, um, but you won't get into it further than that with the individual veteran. You will, again, point the veteran toward County Veteran Service Office, toward the USDVA for direct guidance as to, uh, or, or for the justice system, as to what is required to be shared. Okay? California is a community property state. Um, that has uh, a, a series of very special guidelines. Uh, that address specifically how military benefits must be handled upon the dissolution of a marriage. But again, we're not lawyers, judges, anything like that. So we, we invite them to, number one, have an understanding that that is a problem, and number two, direct them to um, multiple agencies, the County Veteran Service Office, the uh, local court system, the USDVA. Okay. Oh, language, right? We've been, I've been trying to avoid using, you know, acronyms other than like one that we all know now. County Veteran Service Office, County Veteran Service Officer, NCO, Non-Commissioned Officer. I've probably said more acronyms than I realized I did this morning. Uh, so here are just a few, just to whet the appetite. Can I ask you a question? Please. Please. Sort of move on to this. Mm -hmm. uh, the mobility of the service as they move from state to state, do they determine how long you've been in this state before you can? Uh... I think I understand what you're asking. Are there certain state benefits that require a certain amount of time of serving in the military or living here? And the, the very good answer that's a straightforward, simple answer is no. No. Fortunately, I can't think of any benefits actually where uh, a great example is, remember I told you about the, the, the flagship of state-specific veterans benefits is the dependent fee waiver for college. Letting your kids go to school for free, you know, minus food and lodging. Um, that is available to the veteran-dependent resident of California. So if I follow my master plan, and after our kids move out of the house and my wife and I move back to Hawaii, where I had a very difficult overseas tour of duty long ago, 
uh, as long as our kids remain in California and maintain state residency, they get to do that dependent fee waiver benefit because of my service. What's that? How long has that been in effect? Oh, gosh. No. Longer than I've been working is here. Is it retroactive if you didn't know of it? No, unfortunately. And that's, and that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it that way because we always get, I'll, I'll be right with you, David. We always get questions about, hey, well, I didn't know, so can I get like a check for the tuition and fees for, right? And the answer, straight, again, straightforward, easy, but difficult to tell them answer is no, because it is a waiver of the benefits. It's not a payment of that fee on anybody's behalf. It is the college, it is the state-run college systems that have agreed to not force a payment to occur. So there's no money changing hands. Um, in California, I don't know. That might be that might be a federal one. You're thinking, David, you had something to add to that. Yeah, I have a caveat about that. Um, get the refund. Most schools I work with, and it is a school by school policy. They will refund the current semester you're in. So if you already because you have to wait for the rating to come back, and if you're already in the, if your kids already paid for you know three three thousand dollars, they may be able to get uh, and that's a really good point that David brings up. Um, you, have some, you have some absolutes to tell the veterans about, but you want to always leave them with um, a feeling of hope. Okay, Many things are negotiable, particularly in the education benefits world. Um, a number of colleges that are non-public have agreed to participate as though they are a public institution or certain education benefits. Typically more on the, uh, more on the uh, federal for the veteran him or herself side of the house for the, like the GI Bill type of benefits. Okay, there are schools that will kind of waive the excess because we're a hoi polloi private USC institution or Stanford or whatever. They will still allow the veteran to have access to that education. Um, without forcing that veteran to pay the, the additional difference. At times that happens. It also can happen at private institutions where the private institution will at least allow that fee to be waived up to and including the uh, most expensive public institution fee that that parent presumably would have been paying. Okay, So the parent at some private schools will simply need to make up that difference. Okay, Again, it's up to the individual institution of higher learning. So that is the one important point that you need to share with the veteran. Okay, Check with the individual institution. Go back to the county veteran service office. They know all about the, the, all the players in the region, all of the schools, and what they are willing to or not willing to do for your dependent students. Sir? They still have a certain amount of time that you have to take advantage of your education and uh, well, uh, for, the, for the veteran him or herself, they have uh, 15, 10 to 15 years, yeah, yeah, 10 to 15 years for the, for the veteran him or herself. Now, we will get into the nuances of the dependent fee waiver since it's such a big deal with the state, but just not, not yet. We'll do that after break in the next module. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and it's not something, again, that we want you to memorize. It's something that we simply want you to know, like, which page in the resource book, you know, that you can read that. And speaking of resource book, before the next module, we will have, we'll have boxes of those in here so you can uh, kind of follow along, okay? Next module will be more that interactive, hey, now we're going to pretend like there's a veteran with us, and where do we find that info, okay? All right. Oh, gosh. Leave. F-O-B, M-O-S, O-I-F, O-E-F, op tempo. You guys have been reading that while I've been windbagging it. Calvet, home and farm loans. Yes, sir. Well, what do you, uh, what residence requirements do you have to have upon exiting the military in order to claim those benefits? You are, for a Calvet home and farm loan, number one, you want to, as David brings it back, get the veteran to read the page in this resource book or get them online with you and you want to discover with them what I'm going to tell you now. Okay? Cuz I again, I don't want you guys to try to memorize things. We're not here to we're not here to provide at the PhD level. Okay? But the bottom line for the California 
state benefit, which is a, a uh, somewhat competitive home loan, is that you must be a California resident veteran, and it must be your primary residence. Okay, those are pretty much the only ground rules. Um, so in other words, you can't use that loan to buy a property that you're going to rent out. Okay, you can't use it to launch your business career as a, as a landlord. Okay, um, and when I say competitive, I mean that very recently they did lower the interest rates, but frankly, they're still just a cut above all the commercial banks that are willing to lend to you. Now, the advantage of the CalVet loan, however, is um, the veteran, generally speaking, can qualify for it more often than with uh, commercial banks nowadays, because commercial banks are all running a little scared. It's a lot more difficult to qualify for a loan post um, housing crunch, post loan crunch. Okay, uh, The CalVet loans are, in fact, funded by, backed by uh, sale of uh, state government bonds. So the state has an obligation to investors. And that's why um, they're not the most rock bottom, because they are paying out a benefit to those that are investing in them, as well as being a benefit for the veteran. To qualify for it, do you have to be a California resident at the time that you discharge? No. Do you have to enlist from it? Or no, it ha it will, it, they, will, they will have nothing to do with where you served or were you in California when you were discharged or anything like that. It's simply where you are now. If you are now a California resident and you served in the armed forces in Kentucky your whole life, that's fine. As long as you're a California resident now. Okay? So uh, yeah, that's one of the... One of the other state benefits that we get a lot of questions about, and CalVet has a, a whole division dedicated to home and farm loans, and so that's exactly where I would direct a veteran to, other than to give them a brief couple sentences, I would say, and you know what, I'm not a loan officer. Um, here's the page that talks about the loans. Here's the 1-800 number. Here's the website. Okay? Um, there is a short paragraph about exactly what what the CalVet home loan is all about, what you need to do to qualify for it in, in very general terms. Okay. By the way, there is a CalVet office here in town. You, what's that? There is a CalVet there is one. office here in yeah. Bakersfield. And, and they've been reducing those field offices quite a bit. And this is one of the ones that's still in existence. So that's good news for your veterans that come in here. OK, this is it. You know all about military, ranked, branches of service, the Air Force is the best, the active versus reserve components, and unique stressors, and you know about demographics and things that are problems for veterans when they come to you. Uh, why do we need to know a little bit about all of this stuff? Because, man, I can't, okay, there you go. Because um, that understanding is going to, number one, help you to figure out what the veteran needs. And number two, it's going to help you build that trusting relationship with the veteran. They're going to open up more. You're going to be more successful in uh, working with them. Okay?